Praise the Lord. Um, I went to Ethiopia for two weeks uh, during the vacation. And in Ethiopia, it is really very hot. When I came back here, I was really freezing. And when I went there, because it was very cold here, I put on a lot of layers, and there I was melting. I experienced really hard weather conditions here and there. Um, and I hope you, you are enjoying your uh, winter school as well. Today, <clears throat> I'm going to share the Word of God with the theme that says the path of humility. And if it is correct, the Korean translation, Kyomson, is that correct? All right. <clears throat> there are so many directions on the picture you can see, and the options are too much. Um, in life also, we have a lot of um, options, directions to choose in life. Um, <clears throat> and again, to, um, I, uh, I think this is my second time to preach in, in Jesse's chapel about the, the theme of humility. Uh, last time when I was preaching, I was saying humility is a dimension of wisdom. If you remember, wisdom has so many manifestations, a lot of dimensions, and I say one is humility. Technically to say humble people are wise people because there are so many uh, uh, outcomes coming from the path of humility. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3, the Bible says this one, and let's read it together. 1, 2, 3. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I urge you to walk <clears throat> in the path of humility is the message. I ask two questions written in one here. The first one, what is the direction of humility? And then the second one, what is the definition of humility? So when we say definition, we are asking the meaning. In every culture, there is a meaning or concept of humility, I'm pretty sure. It's not the same, very distinct. It may have different values, but there is a trace of humility in family, society, in the government we belong, or the state we belong to. There is a culture, and humility, or the concept of humility, is embodied in that culture. We are not comparing cultures, but I'm saying there is a trace anyway. And then the second one is, what is then the direction of humility? Where does it go? Um, say, for example, in China, there is a saying, a proverb that says, be like the bamboo. The higher you grow, the deeper you bow. Probably if we set the priority here and we say, be like the bamboo, the deeper you bow, the higher you grow. Because I'm, I'm uh, assuming humility might be a precondition for any path of greatness. Therefore, first, <clears throat> excuse me, a person needs to bow deeper, perform humility, know the value of humility in life. Then, of course, greatness or achievement, success in any sort, it will be inevitable. Um, not only cultures, also religions teach about humility. In Islam, or Buddhism, Confucianism, and Christianity. I'm just naming a few of them. There is a trace of the concept of humility. But I think humility is very much, very well articulated in the Christian religion. Before I explain, let me define. This is a dictionary definition of humility. One, it says a modest view of one's own importance. When people view themselves, especially the importance of themselves in relationship and in the society, there is a certain perspective about the self. But when it comes to humility, humility always takes the path of 
modest, modesty. Not exaggerating too much, but there is a, a modest view of the self in humility. That means, in other terms, it's the absence of arrogance. Now, when I say the absence of arrogance, I'm not saying it's an achievement of one time. You all agree with me that avoiding arrogance in our life is not easy. Because, unfortunately, again, every culture and tradition has its own way of teaching people how to be proud or arrogant. Therefore, the absence of arrogance is an achievement of an ongoing process. Every day, we have to challenge ourselves to be free of arrogance. Do we succeed? I doubt. Sometimes we may fail, but it's a lifelong ongoing process to have an absence free. Um, what is that? Uh, absence of arrogance or free of arrogance. That doesn't mean that it's a denial of strength or it's not a denial of our intelligence, our achievements. They are there, we cannot deny. They are the realities. But we try our best so that we may not be tempted to be arrogant or brag or show off. This is a very simple definition of humility from a dictionary. But when we go to the theological definition of humility, there are more elements coming there. These are about five elements I have here. Number one, the theological definition of humility is meekness. Please, all of you say meekness. meekness. That is being gentle in our relationship to God, to others, even to ourselves and other creatures. And then again, being forbearing, having forbearance. That means you endure. You will be patient. That is meekness. And then the second one is obedience. We cannot be humble people without we show a quality obedience to instructions, rules, regulations, to people, to people who are leading us. We need to show obedience. And that is the manifestation of humility. Is it easy to always obey? Thank you for being honest, <laughs> right? It is not easy, it's a hard task. We need to work hard so that we may be able to obey, especially instructions and rules, regulations. It's not easy. There is some tendency, natural tendency, of objecting instructions and rules. We say, why? Why always? Why me? But, but you know, why not me, is the answer. The third point is respect. We respect God, we respect ourselves, and then we respect God. That is a manifestation of humility. And the fourth one is submissiveness. When we say submissiveness, we are talking about authority. We are talking about lead leadership. It could be in a family, classroom, organizations, state, laws, different kinds of laws, we always need to submit to them. Uh, maybe you may uh, think, how about being critical of laws, instructions? Yes, we can be critical, but there is a certain manner of being critical again. Maybe if I have time, I will explain that one later. And then the last one is being modest, modesty. This is related to two things. One related to self-perspective. We need to be modest, not exaggerating ourselves too much. And the, the other one is our perception about our own abilities when we perform things, skill, potential, whatever, in terms of abilities, again, we need to be modest. This is the teaching of Christianity that we see in the Bible. Now, when the Bible requires us to be humble people, it's not just giving us the instruction, but there is a perfect model. Jesus Christ is the one who set the standard of humility. I told you towards the beginning of this sermon, in fact, 
Almost every culture try their best to teach humility to their children, to the young generation. There is a value of humility, whether it is very well articulated or not, whether it is only there as an instruction, a requirement, or set a good example. But Christianity explains humility the best. And that is because Jesus is the one who set the standard of humility himself for us. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. And I say here, live alone to live the life of humility that Jesus Christ lived here on earth. Even fully to understand such humility is very hard. How could it be possible for a person to empty himself or herself for the sake of the success of others, for the betterment of others? It's so hard to even comprehend. But regardless of our lack of understanding, Jesus Christ set the standard of humility. You may ask how Jesus Christ put this humility as a standard in the Christian religion. The right direction for humility is downward. Let's read this one. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7b to 8. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on the cross. I highlighted two things here. He made himself nothing. He humbled himself. And the extent is to the point that he emptied himself. This is known as the chapter of kenosis, or the place where the Bible explains how Jesus Christ emptied himself, left his position with his father, and became one of us. Always, the direction for humility is downward. There are so many directions, up directions and side directions, but I'm saying unless we have the willingness to put ourselves down, this is not lack of ability or lack of potential, but this is for the betterment of others, we willingly put down ourselves. That is the path of humility. Um, one of the theological theme that we teach in classes is known as incarnation. Have you heard this word, incarnation? Incarnation means um, God taking the human form in the body of Christ. The deity became one of us. The fact that Jesus, the Son of God, became one of us is known as incarnation. Please, all of you say incarnation. So now you can imagine, the process of incarnation has one direction. Which direction is that? Is it up direction or downward? Definitely it's a downward because God becoming human being, he became one of us. From above, he came to the lower position. And then he set the standard of humility. Then he required his followers, followers to be humble. That's why I show here the arrow. The path of ministry, the path of humility always follows downward. Now we can, if we have the time, we can um, check our own culture, tradition, values. Uh, what are some of the downward directions that we can find in our culture? One example is Confucianism that I mentioned before. Uh, you need to bow down like a bamboo so that your greatness will start. And if we think every culture, probably we will be able to find some trace of humility. Through the incarnation, Jesus became the Son of Man. In the Gospel, actually, there is an expression of Jesus Christ that the Bible refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. 
Many places, if the Bible says the Son of Man, that refers to Jesus Christ, especially in the Gospel. Then, through the process of this incarnation, Jesus becoming the Son of Man, the result became we, human beings, get the opportunity to become the children of God. I always ask two questions related to our prayers. The first question is, are we humble enough to approach God? Are we humble enough to change our mind? Then the second question is, does your prayer change your mind? We always have the desire to change our situations, change others, change the social uh, um, hierarchy and the social values. But the, the, the question always, the moment we finish our prayer, does our prayer change our mind? Are we humble enough to change according to maybe our ideas or our decisions, whatever it is, according to the word of God? Second one is ministry. Without being humble, one cannot have a successful ministry. Third is service. Whatever service you offer for people, it needs to be embodied in humility. I think sometimes business is much better in services compared to other, um, you know, the ministry that churches are offering. This is a very strong statement, but it's true. Then the next one is relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with others always needed to be in humility. The Bible says, walk humbly with your God. This is taken from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. We walk together with God, and the manner of our walk needs to be always accompanied by humility. And then the next one is mission work. Um, I teach sometimes... Um, uh, the ethics of mission, short-term mission, long-term mission. And mission work, one of the greatest challenge of missionaries is humility. Every, the moment they decide to go to the mission field, there is a sense of, I am better than them. And that is actually kicking off humility. That's why we say, okay, Incarnation is a very good prototype for every mission work that we are doing, whether it's a short-term mission or long-term mission. We needed to make humility um, the means. Then I say here, humility is manifested in many ways. One, lifelong willingness of learning. That is one of manif the manifestation of humility. We need to have that willingness to learn. No matter how much educated we are, we need to have room to learn because education is a lifelong thing or achievement. Even in our retirement, in our, in our uh, deathbed, we learn. If a person stops learning, that means that person is dead. Second one, critical self-reflection. Now, most of the time, the academic manner is shaping people's mind to be critical of theories and ideas, concepts, which is very good. I enjoy that. But usually, we train our brain and our mind to be critical of others. We do not have the, the boldness to be critical on ourselves. Usually, we are very much generous to ourselves. Even when we make mistakes, even when we are wrong, we are not critical to ourselves. But a humble person is always critical and will have a critical self-reflection on actions, thoughts, words, whatever performances we are doing. Recognize and change growth areas. Nowadays, we change the term weakness to growth area. Well, this is psychological because people have no courage to say this is my weakness. If you ask me what is your strength, I will tell you a lot of things, even exaggerating. Then with the moment you say, then tell me your weakness, I lack of vocabularies. Then nowadays we change the term to growth areas. Recognize and then have the willingness to change your own growth area, that is the performance of 
humility. If you have difficulties listing down in your own room uh, your growth areas, then that means you are struggling with having true humility. Have the sense of accountability. This accountability can be individual and accountability and also organizational accountability. A person who is not humble will have difficulty to be accountable in every responsibilities he or she is receiving. Why we do this all? It's because humility has a reward. We all love reward. We work for rewards. There are rewards that come with humility. The path of greatness starts with humility. We have mentioned that towards the beginning of this sermon. Humility abstains humiliation. I consider these two, humility and humiliation, as opposite things. Because humility is something that you are doing willingly. Humiliation is when humility is forced on you against your desire. Humiliation. Then I say here, humility abstains, nullifies humiliation. We imitate Christ in the path of humility. We establish and maintain peace when we are humble, whether that's in marriage or any, in any form of social relationship, we can establish peace only when we are humble enough. And I'm saying this, uh, this humility not only individually, actually, this humility has to go in terms of um, states, in terms of um, organization, institutions, whatever you call it. Any entity that incorporates society needs to have humility. And the last one, we light the evil world. The world that's full of arrogance and conflict. When we are able to show humility, then that will shine in the evil world. Let me tell you some practical lessons and I will wind up. Let's read it together. Number one. Yes. Very simple. It's not a rocket science. How can I be uh, humble? Or we uh, do not need to read a lot of books and textbooks to be humble. Being humble is have care for people around us. Our classmates, our school friends, people in our neighborhood, people who are living with us, we need to be uh, willing to care for people around us. And when we say care, the actual care, genuine care, starts from emotion, from the inner feelings. Usually when we say care, we, we consider physical things, maybe giving things or providing things. That is after we have that inner care for people with our feelings with our words second let's read it and my managing time is not easy but it's easier than managing emotions managing resources it's not easy but easier than managing emotions the bible says a king is powerful to manage and control his subordinates soldiers and every workers but king is not able or not easy to control his or his emotion. Next one. Always have room to learn. I've already mentioned that one. This is a practical lesson. Even in aspect where you are a professional, very well experienced, always needs to, uh, to be room to learn. Next one. Do not be afraid to self-criticize. Be bold enough every day to reflect on yourself so that you will be a better person. We need to increase in love. Love is something that needs to increase. It's, there's no stagnant point for love. Next, we need to be careful of excessive and merciless criticism of others. Yes, we need to be critical, but criticism is always done when you have a better alternative. <coughs> In my country, because this is Korea, I can talk about my country. It's very uh, dangerous to say things, especially critical of the government. But I am safe here, so it's not a big problem. <laughs> they demolish some neighborhood because that neighborhood is built without master plan. 
But always when they demolish, they will have no better master plan or better resources to provide for the people. Therefore, people who are, um, who are, their, people who, their houses demolished, they just go to the street to demonstrate against the government. Even now when I went, I saw many people on the street always demonstrating against the government. And then I say, oh, the government, before they provide the resource, before they have good plan, they demolished. And then it's the same thing on criticism. When we are critical of others, before you perform your critics, Make sure you have a better, better alternative to offer. Then you can be critical. It's not only deconstructing. You also need to reconstruct. Therefore, be merciful when you are critical of others. This is also a manifestation of humility. Let's read this Bible verse and we will pray. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Humble yourself, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Let us pray.